Hey guys, Brian with Cajun Cardboard coming at you with another episode of Five Hobby Questions. And today our guest is the famous Jake Roy, 90s B-Ball Cards on Instagram, 90s B-Ball Cards on YouTube. Jake, thank you for coming on the channel. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to it. For those of you who have not listened or followed or, uh, or aren't even on Instagram, which is uh, quite impossible to believe, uh, Jake is... Um, on YouTube, he's 90s B-Ball Cards, okay? And so I've got his uh, YouTube channel pulled up. He does fantastic content. Um, he, he's like everything I do, only a little bit bigger, a little bit better, a little bit smarter. Uh, his channel talks about card collecting tips, pack ripping, mail days, thoughts on 90s cards, and he goes deep into 90s cards, which is why I love to watch his YouTube stuff. He does lots of PSA uh, submission reveals and lots of question and answer sessions. So if you like my channel, you're certainly gonna like Jake's channel. Um, that's his channel that you see on your screen right here. His Instagram is right here. It's 90, 90s underscore b-ball underscore cards. So easy to find. If you haven't found him yet, hit pause, go find him on YouTube and uh, subscribe and, uh, and then go follow him on Instagram. Uh, Jake, are you ready for these five impossible questions? As ready as I'm gonna be. Okay. Here we go. Uh, the first thing we always do with all our guests, and, and people can kind of figure out what you do based on your Instagram and YouTube, but you've got to describe yourself in 10 words or less, okay? So I want you to talk like a caveman. Don't use the and I also or any of Just 10 phrases that best describe Jake Roy and how you fit in the hobby, where you've been, and where you're going. Yeah, I could probably do it in less. Uh, so describe me uh, father, husband, 90s basketball card collector uh fanatic uh you know and i also love sports and shoes also and, and wine so there's a few things you left out penny not I, penny well you know penny. when penny. we're talking about 90s i like to just generalize because otherwise okay. we'd be way well over 10 words <laughs> well look your wife is gonna be happy you chose father and husband first right i guess right. you probably thought that through so gotta get those brownie uh, points right <laughs> Great. We know who you are now. We've got it. Uh, so question number one, real simple. You got to choose one 90s inserts or 90s parallels. You've got to choose one. Yeah. You know, that's going to be an easy call for me. I'm going inserts. You know, uh, yeah. I mean, it's just that's what that's what the 90s were all about. That's what made us, you know, want to rip packs after pack after pack after pack. You know, those uh, those inserts and just the beauty of the designs. Do I can't say enough about them. Me? Jake, doesn't it seem like the Panini era has flipped it back to where parallels are the chase? I mean, would you not agree? Inserts are almost too commonplace, whereas back then they were almost too damn impossible to pull. Now it's almost they're so common, people are just moving on to the next one. Where's my orange? Where's my silver? Where's my green? You know, they want the parallels now. Um, I hope we can get back there. I hope Fanatics comes in and, and has a little transition and they put some, uh, you know, rare inserts in there. Right now, the only rare inserts are the parallel inserts, you know, the gold inserts right. and, the gold, you know, whatever. So I hope they get back there. Do you Are you with me? Don't you hope that yeah. that kind of takes a note out of the 90s? I definitely agree with that. I mean, and I think because a lot of people are parallel focused because of the modern product, you're seeing that trickle into some of the 90s where, like, you know, a lot of the people who say that they're 90s collectors, really they're honing in on the parallels. You see PMGs are really big. Rubies are really big. You know, there's a number of other really rare, but uh, very popular right now, 90s parallels uh, that get a lot more of the shine. And you're also starting to see, though, some of the Panini inserts that actually have some thoughtful design work done on them are starting to get some more traction. You know, so obviously everybody sees Kabooms, but you've also got some other stuff like Net Marvels. A lot of people really love those. Yep. Uh, you know, and now people are starting to say, okay, we'll see enough of the illustration cards. Let's see some other stuff. But people are looking at like old, uh, I think it's called innovation. There's like a laser cut design uh, insert, you know, so you're starting to see some of the Panini inserts get some more uh, attention. And I think that Panini's taking some of those hints and they're starting to try to focus on that. But hopefully Fanatic sees that information and they say, okay, we know, uh, we know what we need to do here. Yeah. Keep their, keep their eyes and ears open and just let the hobby tell you what they want. Um, yeah, one of the things I love about your channel is that you'll be you'll be popping through stuff and you'll pull an insert out and I pride myself on kind of not knowing the 90s basketball, but you'll pull an insert out and I'm like, what the hell is Jake talking about? And immediately I'll jump on eBay and see, does this what is this? What is he even talking about here? You know, I'll go to card ladder, check prices. I was like, I gotta snatch me one of those. Right. So I love to see the uh the off the radar stuff that you kind of pull out of the weeds that, that you know so well. All right, question number two. 
Uh, this one's also very straightforward. It's a it's an either or hand numbered uh, or serial numbered from the 90s. Yeah. So if I have to pick one, I'm going to go with the, the serial number, the stamped ones. Uh, the hand number don't bother me, though. I know uh, uh, the crossover, there was a big conversation that Chris, you know, is very firmly against the yeah. hand number. They don't bother me. I think they are kind of a little bit neat uh, in some regards. The the hand number ones that I don't like are the replacement cards. So, you know, like if you get, you know, something that was supposed to be stamped and it's damaged and you, you know, back in the day, if you let tops or upper deck know, they replace it in nine times out of ten. Those were the hand numbered ones. Um you know, so where the rest of them are stamped, I want I want mine to be stamped. I don't want that replacement one. Um, but if it's supposed to come out of the pack, you know, it's it's okay. But you're yeah, not going to turn it down, right? Exactly. You're not going to turn down a '90s hand numbered card, right? No, no. Well, you've always got the middle ground, right? Like the grand finales, the diamond dimensions, where it's part hand numbered, and then the denominator is serial numbered. So you right. can always kind of meet in the middle. Um, cool. That's a good answer to number two. I, I, I say hand numbered because I think that just means an extra person's touched it. And I don't know, that just seems really cool. Although it's probably just some employee that wrote the numbers on there with good penmanship. So imagine uh, if it wasn't though, imagine if it was like almost yeah. a player autograph, you know, that'd yeah. be pretty cool. It would be cool. Um, all right, here we go. Question number three, if you had to collect an ultra mod and you might collect an ultra modern prospect, I don't know why I presumed you did not, but if you had to, and if you don't, but if you had to collect an ultra modern basketball prospect, who would your ultra modern prospect be? Yeah, so I don't. Um, if I had to pick, you know, so looking at the last few draft classes, like if I was going to pick somebody from this year's draft class, for example, I'd pick Paulo. Uh, you know, so it also depends on where he gets drafted, because if he gets drafted by the Rockets, I really can't stand the Rockets. Uh, so that would probably, uh, you know, impact that. But if he gets drafted by the Magic, I'm definitely all in. Um, yeah. You know, but so along those same lines, like going to the last year's draft class, I would go with Jonathan Kaminga. My wife loves the the Warriors. I think he's got a bright future. He's a lot of fun to watch. Um, the year before that, I'd go with Cole Anthony, Magic. Um, but I also liked watching him, even though I'm a Duke fan, I liked watching him in uh, in college at North Carolina. And my brother's a North Carolina fan, so uh, yeah. that's something that that's fun. Uh, and then, you know, just going one year prior, just just for good measure, um, Jordan Poole, again, Warriors. But I also like Zion. I, I want to root for Zion to be good. I really Thank want you. him to pan out. Um, you know, so those are kind of like the guys, if I was going to collect some some modern guys that I would probably hone in on from each yeah. of the last few. Yeah, and price point's going to drive you towards one or the other sometimes, you know. Absolutely. Sometimes there's like five guys I want to collect, but the one with the lowest price point is the one where you can grow with the biggest. And so that's kind of... That's kind of why I gravitate to certain to certain prospects, but I'm with you. Yeah. So tell me this, uh, and this doesn't count as one of our five questions. Did did Orlando being an Orlando fan drive you to Penny, or did being a Penny fan drive you to be an Orlando fan? Yeah, I think it was definitely Penny before Orlando. Uh, the yeah. two kind of happened at the same time, you know. So uh, my my story for picking Penny as my guy is, you know, in the '90s, my brother and I are very close in age. So there's a lot of rivalry. So he's uh, he's a big Jordan guy, Bulls. So I couldn't root for the same same guy or the same team. So um, the Magic and Penny were kind of like the rival to the Bulls in the East. So I was like, yep, that's my guy. And then, you know, because Penny was really the Jordan rival that I could go back and forth with my brother, who's better. Um, naturally, I went with the Magic. And my favorite color is blue. You know, I love Disney World. So, you know, there's that connection. There's a lot sure. of connections for the Magic for me, so. Well, look, it, depending on what the Magic do tonight, they've got the pieces. It just it may take a year or two, but they've got some they got a foundation there. They got they got a glut of guards. And then if Isaac can come back healthy, they're going to be all right. They're going to they're going to be just fine. But they got to be patient, just like the team that you love the second most, the Rockets. They've also got to be patient. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. And it's funny talking about the Magic. I don't like Jonathan Isaac. I think he's kind of like a jack of all trades, master of none. And for that yeah. team, I really yeah. want a guy who's like got his skill set and got his his niche. Um, but one of the few times they drafted a guy I like, obviously I just talked about Cole Anthony, was Mo Bamba. Um, yeah. I would love to see them develop him, but I've heard rumors that they're going to try to shop him. And, you know, I don't think his value is very high. Uh, I'm an interesting Magic fan because like two years before they moved Aaron Gordon, I was saying get rid of him, you know, get him at yeah. his peak value. Uh, the same thing with... Uh, uh, Vujicic, I was saying trade him. He's an all-star. Trade him now while you can get the most value. Because, you know, just looking at the team, they they were, uh, you know, a team that would be benefiting from getting some younger talent and kind of doing sure. the, what the Sixers did. But 
Anyway, you're gonna get me down a <laughs> get me down a rabbit hole on the magic. We, we went down deep dive on the Orlando Magic, but uh, I'm sure that doesn't bother you. So I, I like the Magic. I think they've got great potential. Um, card uh, question number four: Name your and this is gonna this could be a rabbit hole in and of itself. <laughs> yeah. Name your dream starting five from the '90s. Okay, you get five players. You get one game, open run, pick up game the best five players and you get them in their prime. So you can take, yep. you know, you're not taking Penny's whole career. You could take prime Penny or you could take prime Kobe. Uh, who is your all time starting five and tell me why. Yep. So I'm definitely going to get Penny in there. Um, cool. Obvious. I don't need to go into detail on that. I'm going to skip, I'm going to skip Jordan. Cause I feel like that's too easy. It's low hanging fruit. So I'm going to challenge myself a little bit and try to get a good cohesive group of talent. Um, and I'm going to go with, uh, I debate between Reggie Miller and Mitch Richmond, but I think I'm going to go with Mitch Richmond for the defensive prowess over Reggie. They're both great scorers. Um, then I'm going to go with Grant Hill. Absolutely phenomenal in his peak. Uh, Tim Duncan, I'm going to go with. And then, um, you know, tr- playing to the true 90s basketball style, you have to have a good, solid center. And I, it's really hard for me to pick between Shaq, Hakeem, and yeah, Duncan. You got those, you got but the third one that I always put in there is David Robinson, who I love. And one of the things, too, talking about Chris from House of Jordans and Card Ladder, uh, you know, he and I debate about 90s players a lot. And I always say, like, I really like David Robinson if you're building a team. And he says, well, if you look at the advanced metrics, he might be the best of the three. Yeah. Um, so for that, I'm going to go with David Robinson just to be a little bit different. So you, you put Jordan on the bench. I know why you put Jordan on the bench. You want a penny to get more shots. You want a penny <laughs> to get more shots. So you put Jordan on the pine. Let me tell you my five. I think you would have trouble with my five, but I know you were picking a little bit from your heart and you didn't yep. want to pick Jordan. I would go uh, Jordan at the one or Grant Hill at the one. You've got to put Grant Hill on there. Kids these days, young people do not realize how good Grant Hill in his prime was. So Grant could definitely play the one. And Jordan proved for about a 10-game stretch with like nine straight triple doubles, I think. He could play the one too. So there's my two in the backcourt. I've got – Kobe also on there mm. because he can guard and he can score. And then I've got Shaq and Olajuwon on the same court, man. I've got Shaq at the five and I got Olajuwon because he's only 6'10. I got Olajuwon at the four. That's, that's right. old school 90 with two bigs right there. So that, that's my five right there. Uh, but your five is awesome too. Mitch Richmond, terribly overlooked player in, yes. in India history, especially in the hobby. Um, but there are a couple of really big time Mitch Richmond collectors out oh, there yeah. that I've actually uh, communicated with here and there. So really cool guy to PC. Um, last question. We're back in the nineties. I tailored these questions for you. If, and again, I don't know who, I know who you PC Penny, and I know you have a couple other guys, but if there's one guy from the nineties that you wanted to PC and player collect that you have never done in the past and really put together and go aggressively at a player collection, who would it be? Yeah. So, you know, I have put some thought to this before. Um, so there's two guys that come to mind, Eddie Jones and Antonio McDice. Uh, and I, I lean towards Antonio McDice, um, and it's, it's for interesting reasons, I think. Uh, I, I think he's a very photogenic player. He's got a lot of great action shots on his cards. He was in a lot of great insert sets um, that were kind of like the mid-90s when, you know, some of those best insert sets were coming out. Whereas Eddie Jones had some really good, you know, kind of early 90s when some of the insert sets were starting to build up. It was a very short run. And plus, Eddie Jones... Uh, you know, it's difficult for me to see him in a Lakers uniform and not think about what could have been if they kept him with, you know, Shaq and, and Kobe. Uh, so Antonio McDice, I think, is, is just he's a fun guy and he's in a lot of great sets and, and his cards look really cool. You know who he reminds me of that was a generation later is Amari Stoudemire. They had similar games. They will Absolutely. jump on the rim. They'll come jump and sit on the rim. They'll put you in the rim. Uh, neither one were great defenders, but both right. of them were just big, nasty, physical, true power forwards with a little bit of a face-up game, but just could muscle you as well. Sort of like the Blake Griffins before Blake Griffin. Yep. Yeah, um, Sean Kemp. So all those guys are in that mold. All those guys, yeah. And Sean Kemp, obviously, yeah, fantastic. Well, I love it that you you picked those two players. Like most people would say, those are obscure players, but if you lived in the 90s and you lived and breathed NBA basketball, those two guys were legit. Those two guys were fantastic players that, that the hobby's just somehow forgotten. So... Um, Jake, man, look, I appreciate you joining us uh, again. If you guys aren't watching Jake on YouTube and following him on Instagram, go do it. Um, I'm a big fan. I told you before, I watch about 10 channels on YouTube. Yours is absolutely one of them. And every time I watch your channel, I'm entertained and I learn something new almost every single time I watch it. So 
keep up the great content. I appreciate you joining the channel. Appreciate it. Uh, happy Thanks, to do this as always. Thanks, bud.